I mean, listen, if you don't know the music of my friend Billy Sprague, you don't know Christian music. I mean, that's just a fact because I feel like I consider you one of the foundational members of CCM, just wow. with your history and the business and people <clears throat> you've worked with. But then, I mean, you, you know, if you were around in the, in the early nineties, the Christian radio, I mean, you know, with, uh, uh, press on me, amigo. Oh yeah. Press on moan to me. I mean, that's just oh, yeah. some of these songs you just can't get out of your head. Uh, heaven is a long hello. Oh hello. yeah. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. being, uh, I'm doing a Saturday Night Live skit right now, I know. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, a big song around our house when my kids were little was uh, uh, Come Quite May. And, oh, you know, yeah. just, I went back and listened to that again the other day, just like, oh, all the feels, man. Our, uh, all four of us just, uh, we would rewind that song and play it again and again. And yeah, again. with, with and, Wayne uh, Kirkpatrick's little girl talking. Yeah, oh, that's right, because I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering who that was. Um, yeah, so I just want to say, and what a pleasure it is to finally have you on. I know we've, you know, we've had a, a couple of failed attempts to try and get this, mm -hmm. this interview going, but uh, I know you've got a story to tell and I want to get into all of it, whatever you want to share. So welcome to the One Degree of Andy podcast, Billy Sprague. Well, thank you, Andy. It's It gets me out of my little hermit world down here where <laughs> I, you know, I'm writing down in Florida. I've been here 10 years in August, moved down to be a worship leader at a church. And Oh, wow. What church? Uh, uh, Edgewater. Alliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was there for three years. And um, I'd love to circle back, get back to Nashville. You know, it's I just miss the seasons and the trees and the creative people. Spent 25 years there and it was it was just wonderful. Yeah. Well, I mean, then all of us that live in that area always like at some point I want to live on the coast. I want to live down in that's true. That it area. Is. It's kind of like, you know, grass is always greener. Um, yeah, I've got my shorts and my Crocs on. Oh, and see, I've got my hoodie on because it's cold here in Tulsa today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see the golden scoops back behind you or the scoops back there, the ice cream That's scoops. That's right. And, you know, I I feel like for him had made it as an artist in, in Christian music when we got invited to a golden scoop party. That's right. I remember you we, show up. <laughs> we, we had probably uninvited. I think Reed, Reed Arvin probably invited us. To That's that. right. That's right. But, uh, we had heard so much about it and we finally got invited and it was like a, it was crazy, it was like a who's who of Christian music in the industry that was at that. And man, again, I just have so many great memories of of you back in the day. And again, you're just an inspirational artist to me, uh, well, just you, because man. you know I I always look at my career, and it's funny. I'll I'll say this, and we'll get going. I had someone criticize me on YouTube on one of these episodes, saying you interject too much to talk about yourself. I'm like, well, it's called One Degree of Andy. That's and right. This is this is how <laughs> I've intersected with you all are these in people. The picture. Like, that's right. Yeah, we that's right. Have a podcast. If it wasn't from my experiences, but I, you know, I, I always viewed myself as someone who just kind of, and I was, I had one gift, and that was singing. But when I mm. got around guys like you that could sing and play and write and produce and just create these these beautiful albums and beautiful moments, I just, I'm just, it, it's just great to know you, Billy. And you know, I know we haven't had a lot of conversation over the years, but okay, I'm going to quit fanboying. I want to get to your story. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so so let, let, let's just, I mean, why don't we just start at the beginning? Let's go all the way back to when you arrived on the Christian music scene. Well, I, I tell people I got into music surgically because I, I had surgery for scoliosis on my back when I was 19. I have two steel rods in my back. Oh, wow. And so I was in a body cast for nine months, you know, first six months with a neck brace. And uh, they do it a lot different now. They get you up and going. But I, you know, I missed a year of college and got to know my mom really well. And I read the New Testament all the way through and I played guitar all the time. And, you know, I didn't really know perhaps how big my musical gift was. We all, you know, back then we all wanted to be Paul McCartney. Right. And, um, uh, and a friend came by from Abilene Christian University and said, man, you can play. Why don't you come be in a band with us? And that's uh, that's the year I met Mike Blanton, Brown Bannister, Chris Harris, all those wonderful people, Gary Pig, all those people who nav who gravitated to Nashville. And so Mike Blanton offered me a, a, a two album deal at Word Records when he was in Waco and I was in graduate school in uh, Austin. 
And I said, no, I think I'm, I think I'm going to teach. And so I said, no. And, and at, at two years later, he calls me and I was pretty, you know, graduate school is pretty dry. The motto is if there's a bigger word, use it. And he said, you know, Amy Grant needs a, an acoustic guitar player. I think you should come down here and pray about it. The Lord is going to do this. And bro, I've never heard it put better. He said, we're going to communicate the gospel in a fresh way through music. Hmm. Um, and that's been the mission all along. That, ha that hasn't changed. Wow. Uh, so I went down there, you know, and learned 25 songs and went on the road with Amy and did the two live records with uh, Diagramo and Key. And uh, man, it was um, it was a whirlwind, you know, a baptism of all these creative people and, you know, co-writing. I, I, I'd never co-written. And so, you know, when you when you play racquetball with someone who's better, you got to get better. Uh, yeah. So, you know, when you start writing with people like Wayne Kirkpatrick, um, Joe Beck, all these wonderful writers down there, Gary Chapman, um, you get better. And so I signed a publishing deal and they started reunion records and signed me. And, you know, it, it was just an amazing, uh, my dad was kind of curious about how are you going to make a living at that? And then he came as every dad says, for the, every dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> my dad did the same thing. Yeah. He came to a concert, one of Amy's concerts. So I was playing acoustic guitar and, and uh, he said, wow, this is organized. This is getting big. What's your uh, cut? <laughs> And I said, well, I'm a hired hand. Yeah, it's not Amy's cut. That's right. I'm a hired hand. And then, you know, began to make records. Michael W. Smith produced my first one. He was on Reunion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Reed Arvin, my second, and Gary Chapman, my third record. And so it was it was a wonderful, uh, you know, you, you want to be um, well applied to the mission with what how God's wired you. You know, yeah. I, I, you know that feeling, you know, yeah. did, that God uses you and the music, you know, the music, they're like arrows. You know, we shoot these arrows out into the uh, stratosphere and they, they actually hit hearts. They hit their mark and you begin to get the feedback. Um, and sometimes you feel like, you know, I'm just sort of rhyming for a living uh -huh, yeah. and everyone else is doing the heavy lifting of, you know, on the ground of loving people. And, but uh, one of the things that changed that for me was, you know, the song Via Dolorosa I co-wrote with Niles Borup in about 1985. Oh, wow. And it, you know, Randy Cox, we played it for him at the publishing company. He took me right down the studio. I did a guitar vocal of it. Sandy Patty had it on hold the next day. It, and the next year, it won Song of the Year. Well, scroll forward all these years, it's still, you know, it's just chords I learned at church camp and from a college buddy and the story, you know, the Lord's story is the power of it. It's not the chord changes we chose. Yeah. But if somehow, you know, a song, a piece of art can focus something for us that really brings us to that, the source of that power. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the, I think that's one of the burdens of an artist is that we understand what our gifts are. Like we know what we can do. Mm -hmm. but we don't know, like, we don't know how God's going to use it. We don't know if anything's going to hit, and, you know, and people outside the industry look at us and go, oh, I would love to live that life. I would, you know, that's, that's the kind of life I would, when you get in it, you're kind of like, just do the next thing. I don't, I don't know. I don't, you don't write Via Dolorosa and think, oh yeah, it's the next big, it's the next no. big hit in Christian music. You don't, you just don't know. And that's the, it's the wild, crazy life of being, assigned artist is man you just whatever let's just do the next thing right yeah and you try to stay connected with um you know things that you you guys have done that you stay connected with yeah. compassion international or you do some mission mm -hmm. trip you uh, you help people raise money for things that are are uh, drilling wells you know for mm -hmm. water around the world yeah um so that it's not just um you know the bible's pretty clear in first corinthians um, if it doesn't have love, it's just a clanging symbol, right? That's right. You're doing it for yourself. Yeah. 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 And, and our pastor, Don Fento was really big on, he would have gatherings of artists and he would say, 
you you guys think you you know you came here to Nashville to hear yourself on the radio and and people applaud you, but he's God's going to use you, scatter you. He's going to scatter the music, and he's done that a lot. You know, a lot of us when the streaming technology really dried up the royalty stream, mm -hmm. a lot of us scattered. You know, Bruce Carroll went to Memphis to a big church. Yeah, he said, Billy, this is this is amazing to bring your gift under the umbrella of a a ministry is fantastic. Plus direct deposit every two weeks and insurance. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, <laughs> yep. and, and you're really part of a, a, a community and a team that has a mission. Uh, and so I did. I, that. Yeah. I, I do did feel that. like, yeah, there's a bunch of us that have done that. And I feel like it, it does close the circle of what our gift was meant for is that it's, it, I don't think it was wrong. You know, I've, I've felt, you know, not, not shame or guilt and maybe not even regret, but just like uh, maybe a misplacement of my gift. I felt that throughout my Christian music career, just going, is this all it's supposed to be? Is there something else that I'm supposed to be doing with this? And when I began to lead worship full time, it was, it was that revelation like, oh, this is the full circle mm -hmm. of performance is great. And it's, you know, we want to sharpen our gifts. The Bible's full of examples of God saying, I gave you a gift. I want you to maximize it absolutely uh, but then when you do when you do when you get into a church and you start to serve people instead of serving yourself you see it more uh, you know on a grander level than even you know i would imagine being in a in an arena with amy grant and having thousands and thousands of people there for me i know leading worship on easter sunday morning at my church mm -hmm. was just as thrilling as you know being in a packed out stadium with people who'd paid money to be there. And I, I just, there were so many, I, I, I would venture to say out of the 50 plus people that I've had on this podcast, maybe only three or four don't lead worship somewhere. I right. didn't figure out right. that that was what my ultimate calling was. And yes, it or, is or at, least, or at least how it closed the loop. Like I said earlier. Yeah. It's a full circle thing. Uh, Mike yeah. Blatt's sister sat me down in the spring of 1981 and I was tired of graduate school and I was doing some carpentry work with some friends. And she said, you know, I don't see you being intentional with your gift. And she read me the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. And the Lord gives three different people, three different amounts of money. And he goes away and two of them uh, have a return on that. And the third one buried it. And she said, if you don't do something with your music, God's going to be hacked. That's right. He's going to call you wicked and lazy. Yeah. That's right. And, and <laughs> yeah. And so I began to, uh, a friend booked me a bunch of things in Colorado. I began to sing at youth groups and bought a little truck. And then Mike Blanton came in and said, hey, uh, you need to think about getting into this. God is about to move big time through the music. And so the full circle thing, you're right, coming back to the church was, was an amazing, um, uh, you know, an, another way to be well applied to the mission. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Who who were some of the what were some of the big biggest songs you wrote before your solo career had its biggest songs? Well, the first one that happened, I co-wrote a song <clears throat> with Jim Weber, a buddy of mine, because I got a phone call from a friend, and uh, uh, and he was just hitting a wall, was kind of empty, and we wrote a song called "Can You Reach My Friend." Oh wow! And Debbie Boone recorded it, hmm. and. You know, that right at uh, a year after I got to town. And, you know, when you hear that and Mike Blanton says, hey, Debbie Boone's cutting your song. It, you know, it it's so gratifying that the music, you know, goes beyond you. And she could she could sing that to a lot more people than we ever would. And and then it got cut by Babby Mason and others. And, yeah. you know, I, I still get little trickles of royalties from that. <laughs> I bet you do. All these years, oh, all these years later. Song. Mm -hmm. You know, and then uh, had a couple of songs with Kathy Coley and uh, uh, BB and CC Wine and uh, I O U Me, and oh, wow. uh, so th that came from being in that network of co-writing. BB used uh -huh. to stay with me when he was single before he got married, and uh, he was a hoot. He still uh, is. <laughs> he is. He is one of a kind. But, yeah. So it was. It was all of that. Um, you know, is that just show up syndrome? You know, if you just show up, yeah, 
um, and respond uh, to where God wants you to go. Were you were you uh, were you like a hitman? Were you like one of those guys that just kind of came in, like they would say, "We need Billy Sprague on this song. We need we need to call Billy to help us finish this song." Because I know several guys like that in Nashville that yeah they don't ne- they aren't necessarily the starters. They're the finishers. They're the ones that right. come in and can help these songs turn the corner. Yeah, I did that some, and I was fortunate. Excuse me, I was fortunate to have a relationship with Wayne Kirkpatrick. And uh, he's no slouch of a writer. No, nope, no. Nope. And so I would pray that he would get stuck on songs and talk. <laughs> and and when he began to produce Susan Ashton, uh, we collaborated on a half dozen of hers. Um, and so that it was gratifying to to that. And and now we're doing that. You know, we started several years ago. Joe Beck and Gary Glover and Mike Land. We started a thing called Songwriting University. <clears throat> it's an online songwriting curriculum and we we can team aspiring writers with hit songwriters yeah for a fee you you can spend two hours writing uh with a hit songwriter and you really up your game wow and then people get to we take their idea and help mold it so i've always liked that uh, collaboration thing because you know you'll think you'll see things uh, that i don't see and yeah. say things I wouldn't say. Well, you're and giving so, people the opportunity that you got when you were just starting out. <laughs> that's right. You know? That's right. Yeah, to be in that network mm-hmm. uh, and think, well, I could never write a song with Bobby Boyd, who wrote uh, God Bless the Broken Road for Rascal Flats. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or, or uh, Bill Shore, who's written, you know, huge country songs for Garth and so there are guys you can you can write with. The, the, the problem sometimes is just access and yeah. proximity. That's right. Yeah, where do I start? And that's a great place to, right. to send people. What's that, what's that website? It's songwritingu.com. Songwriting, the letter U, dot com. Okay, yeah. Uh, so if you're listening to this or watching this and you're an aspiring songwriter, that's a, I think that's a great gift. I, I, no matter how much money it is, I don't even know how much it is, but you know, that's, that's worth it to, yeah. to be around professionals. You would do that with anything, you know, if you want to be <laughs> yeah, and there, are, at, there are eight, you know, there, yeah. there, there are eight lessons, you know, that lead to, you can learn a lot about songwriting, but actually, you know, learning by writing a song and you, you go back and forth and go, no, I don't think that that line is quite working. What about, um, uh, and you see, you chip away at it and finally there's a song there. And then we have, you know, fantastic musicians in Nashville who demo these things and people are blown away to go, man, I, I just never thought I could create on that level. So as uh, sorry for the turn here, but I just keep seeing those ice cream scoops behind you and mm-hmm. I have to, we have to talk about it. Are, yeah. are you still an ice cream freak? Is this something I am. That you... I've, I've had to cut my consumption down considerably. <laughs> as, as have we all. Yes. <laughs> you know, if I eat ice cream late at night, I won't sleep. My brain will just keep going. Um, Where did that come from? Like what? I, so I remember, I remember there was this Mexican vanilla that was, mm. I don't even know if it was legal to have in the U.S. But <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. remember that was the word on the street was, was the Mexican vanilla has been yeah. delivered and it's time for a golden scoop party. Yeah, we, we named it after Willow. It's called Mexican Willow Vanilla. And uh, it started by, you know, I, I, made homemade ice cream with my dad growing up all of us kids. We sat on the the mixer, you know, and he churned it. And then when we got bigger, the little brother sat on it and we churned it. So I grew up making homemade ice cream and loving it. And when I moved to Nashville, I made a friend who uh, was into antiques. And we went to all these antique places and flea markets. And I started seeing all these different designs of scoops. So, so I pick them up here and there. And I've got probably 120 now. Um, and this this is a timeline from like 1895 to the present. Oh, wow. There's 80 of them up there. So to me, it it became a real symbol of you know, a metaphor of, you know, savoring life, the sweetness of life. There's going to be a lot of, you know, none of us get out of here without some bitterness and bitter things that happen and some scars. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, God made this world and said it's good and enjoy, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, we, yeah, we did that for 20 summers in a row in Nashville. And if I move back there, it's likely to be revived. <laughs> one good, one good reason <laughs> to head back that direction. That's right. Well, you talk about the scars and, and, you know, things not always working out the way that you, 
that you thought, and I mean, you went through some trials um, in the late eighties. You want to talk about that? I mean, that's, yeah, that's one yeah, of the that's... stories that, you know, when your name comes <clears throat> up, that's one yeah. of the first things I think about. Yeah. That became central. I was uh, in, head over heels in love with a young woman from Dallas. We met at Camp Kanakuk in Missouri. She worked there. And um, we were going to be married in the spring of 90. And then a week before Thanksgiving, uh, I was in Missouri to do a concert. And I got a call from Joe White, uh, the, the the leader of Camp Kanakuk. And, and uh, it's, you know, you don't want to get the kind of call. The first words were roses with Jesus. Hmm. And his voice was trembling. And I said, what are you saying, Joe? There's been a car accident in roses with Jesus. And... You know, I was running around the planet singing La Via Dieu Me Dieu Est Bon, Life is Hard But God is Good. Yeah. And and then I got really tested on it. You know, life is hard and God is, uh, hmm. you know, it's was, it was a fill in the blank time again, right? Yeah. yeah. Is he uh, absent, indifferent? Is he, did an angel miss a block? What happens, <clears throat> you know, when the world caves in suddenly? And so it was, a, you know, I dragged my heart around through that. And, and you got to have, that's where the song Press On came out of, you know, had some heavy friends. Yeah. So when my heart was a stone and they carried the heartache and made it their own when the currents of sorrow were strong. Um, and so I, Reed Arvin, others, Jim Weber, all these, Mike Nolan, all these wonderful friends uh, gathered around me and really, you know, carried me. I was like the paralytic they were carrying to see Jesus. Mm. And because I wondered, you know, how do I get going again? And, it, but, you know, it, the shock of a thing like that makes you, put you on automatic. I mean, I went ahead and I did the concert that night and not telling everyone what had happened, just sang my songs and at the end sat on the edge of the stage and said, uh, something's happened today that's, uh, um, that if I can't sing the song, these songs on a day like this, I, I may never sing them again. Hmm. And I told him the story. 16 people came to the Lord. Um, wow. And and then the, then the trudging came. came. But from that, you know, we, we did a record. Wayne Kirkpatrick really helped with uh, Torn Between Two Worlds. And then the, 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 the going through that valley. And then... Uh, the wind and the wave was the coming out, you know, the victory, the getting yeah. a full lung load of life again. And, and then subsequently fell in love and, you know, I have three kids. And um, so it, it was a, and, and then the book came, the book letter to a grieving heart came from that, uh, which has sold over 50,000. It's comforting people everywhere. So um, God didn't waste my sorrows in, in my own faith. And as I look at scripture, you know, you're always wondering, these scriptures, don't be surprised when various trials come on you, like something strange is happening. Uh, these are, you know, test your faith and, and create perseverance and faith and refine us. And, you know, at some point, you know, I saw a meme recently on Facebook that said, I don't want any more things that, that can kill me, but make me stronger. I've had enough, <laughs> I've had enough of those. Like, thanks. Uh, how, how strong do I need to be? <laughs> Man. Well, and I remember so too, one of the things that, well, I hate to interrupt, but one of the things that really made an impact on me was how you grieved. Like, and pe people don't, in this, uh, in this culture, don't grieve. We tend, well, like we things to do, we got to get on with it. And I just remember right. hearing about how you came to a full stop and allowed your heart to, to grieve. And I even, I heard a rumor that you shaved your head and yes, you know, I it did. just kind of, you did the biblical grieving process. Can you just take us through that for a moment? Cause I'm fascinated by it just because it's just not, I see pastors and, you know, friends of mine that, you know, obviously when they lose someone close to them, it's devastating, but life has to keep going. Like, Let's get back to work. It's it's the idea of like, well, we can't sit here and waller in our grief. Let's get back to work. Let's get back to life. But right, I, I always, again, certain things about you stick in my mind about this is fascinating what you did and, and how you got through this. Yes, it was a, a slow process. And, and the people who had counseled me, who had grieved, 
uh, Leighton Ford, who lost his uh, 21-year-old son in a heart surgery, he he walked with me and said, you know, this is this is a wound God's going to help you manage. This is not a wound that will ever completely heal because there'll be this longing. We're not meant for this separation. Um, a, a, another friend, uh, Chip Arnold, he's a writer. He he had lost a fiance to leukemia in a matter of weeks. He had a headache and weeks later she was dead. And, wow. and he remarried and had kids. We took a walk in the woods and he said, you're not going to believe this now, but the heart is larger than you think. There's room for a lot of people in there. And so I tucked these things away. Another friend flew from Kansas City, stayed three days, read me C.S. Lewis's A Grief Observed. Mm. And, you know, he and Joy David then got together. She had cancer. Uh, she stayed in England to get some treatment. She went into remission. They got a two or three year beautiful season together. And it returned and she died. And he wrote this. Um, it, it really is uh, the definitive work on grief, you know, that her absence is like the sky. It covers everything. Hmm. He said things like that. So I went through that long valley and people worried. Reed Arvin came to me and said, you know, we're all worried. The, the Billy we know is not going to come back. And I said, well, I don't think he's coming back. Hmm. But they hung with me, you know, and I wouldn't be the same. But I did come back, not just because time heals. I met people who'd lost someone 15 years ago and were still trudging and not coming back to life, not dating anyone again. They had just battened down the hatches and decided this was going to be a trudging event instead of coming back to life. And as we know, we're, we're, we're talking right here after Easter, God's all about resurrection. That's right. And restoration. And so um, that more than anything, you know, running around singing, you know, 95 cities with Michael W. Smith and Kathy Tricoli and singing, uh, you know, you want to have some serious fun. Let's go change the world. And, you know, you're all tan and young and, and working out and, um, and life and gospel is an adventure. But there's very real um, trauma. And Jesus, warned, you know, warned us. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but give good cheer. And he came to have, we came so that we might, might have life to the full in John 10, yeah. 10. There's this tension between this testing and this abundance. And so God bless you if you get out of this life without too many scars. Hallelujah. But God is, God is really good at scars and restoration. And he did that with me through the music. And I just think... So many people were comforted, um, and I tried to grieve honestly, and I, I couldn't have just stood up and pretended I was fine, because I wasn't fine. I was devastated. Yeah. Um, but I found, um, you know, the, the Lord walked this valley of suffering, and I had written about it, Via Dolorosa, La Via Durme Medio e Bon, Life is Hard, but God is Good. Um and people want to know, is, does our faith work in the worst times? And it does. Hmm. Yeah. And, and you don't want to have to go through it, but man, no. If, if you can do it the right way, like you have. And I love what you said, uh, life is hard, but God is good. It feels like to me that wraps up the a lot, like 90% of the message of Christian music, especially <clears throat> in the 80s, 90s, and in early yeah. 2000s before worship kind of took over everything right uh, where now it's god is good and here's what god's going to do for us which is fine but i do miss that era of us talking about the hard things and you know those you mentioned your <clears throat> albums that 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 came after this devastating loss they're so special and i go back and listen to them now i'm like these songs mean something not just because they're great songs because i know what you went through and I yeah. know the hope that you have and the story that you're able to tell out of that. Yeah, it's almost like it's not completely, but before that I was writing about things. Uh -huh. And after that, I was writing from things. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that's what I do now. I, you know, anything that happens, I, I wrote a song on Easter Sunday, listening to a message out of Franklin, wrote a song called Mercy Led Me Home, you know, just I had my guitar in the kitchen. I was watching and I just started writing. And two weeks ago, 
There's another message about Martha waiting for Jesus to show up because Lazarus was sick and he said it was, it was, it was for God's glory. So I wrote a song called waiting for your glory. Mm. Um, you know, it's just the way I process life is to write songs. Well, and it's just, again, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't a songwriter. I, I wrote, you know, I wrote a few here and there, but it's interesting. The older I get the songs that were given to me when I was in my twenties, and when I sing them now to to this, like you were kind of saying before all this happened to you, you were just writing about things. Or, well, I was just singing about things. I believed, yeah. I believed to yeah. be true. But at this point in my life, after so much loss and so much of that road traveled, you know, now I sing these songs and go, wow, mm -hmm. now I understand. Now I understand what, you know, Billy Simon was going through, and, right. you know, way back then. And I'm experiencing that now. And these songs are so much sweeter or, you know, a song that Don Cook wrote, you know, years and years ago that, that I'm singing now or mm. Dave Clark, you know, with all he went through with his, his issues and physical yeah. issues. And, and when I sing them now, I'm like, Oh, I get it. Yeah. I totally get it. So yeah, I, yeah. it's just the, it's the gift that God continues to give to us that, yeah. And, and it's, it's a, it's man, what a, and what a gift being able to sing and play and perform is when you go through loss. Because to me, that's one of the most healing things we can do. We have a place yes. to get up and shout and express our express ourselves in a mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a way that that most people can't that that aren't musicians. And I think that's a real I think it's a real blessing that that we have that, you know, I tell people all the time, like, I, I'm I'm not the most animated person off the stage. That's because when I'm on the stage, I can say all that <laughs> stuff I don't say that's when right. I don't have a microphone and, that's right. and I can get it all out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it doesn't let up. I'm, I mean, there's still, you know, here I am years later from that. And uh, five, five years ago, I'm not sure even my wife decided she didn't want to be married anymore hmm. and told the kids and broke all our hearts. And, you know, she caught that. I say she caught that virus going around. Uh, everywhere i gotta live my own truth hmm. and we were all devastated we we're like wait what what and wrestled through that lots of counseling lots of trying to make it stick but she she wanted out after a quarter of a century so uh years ago after rose and i gary chapman met me coming out of a restaurant he hugged me he said boy bro maybe well, the only good thing right now is maybe this is is as bad as it gets for you. Maybe this is your worst wound. And I said, oh, I sure hope so. I don't know how I could. And I know there are others like, I've never lost a child. Yeah. That's a devastating wound that God will help you manage, bring you back from and, and help you manage. Uh, as Leighton Ford told me, he said, I still, many years later, I walk out in the woods. I miss my son and I weep because I bleed from, because I love him and I'm getting closer to him. I will see him again, but the separation hurts. And, and so here I'm again, you know, fused with another hurt. And what did I do? I've always wanted to write. So I just started, I've written two novels and I've got a nonfiction coming out of letters to my kids here next month. Oh, and wow. so I, I dove into writing again as a part of the healing process. And so uh, you sent me a couple of those books, which I've, I've been um, uh, Music City Mayhem, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, that's been on my reading list for yeah. a couple of years now. So I was thrilled when I opened the box that you sent me and yeah. it's there and that's what I'm going to dive into. My wife's going on a trip next week. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to read like I'm just mm -hmm. going to I'm going to yeah. read and play golf for a week yeah. while she's gone. Well, and, it's, a, uh, it's a detective story, you know, set in Nashville, which was fun. Yeah, to write. I've heard great things about it. Yeah. And I, I told my buddies, I said, I, I've, I take it as a sign of healing that I didn't I didn't kill off a music exec or a pastor. <laughs> <That's> incredible. <laughs> uh, uh, Reed, Reed Arvin had a book. What was his? The The Wind the and Will. the Wheat. The win okay, Wind and yeah. the Wheat. And, and, yeah. and, and then he wrote one called The Will. Yeah. And there were, yeah. I, I remember reading that going, Ooh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people here. I recognize exactly through yeah, these you, books. And so yeah. I was wondering if that would be, if that would pop up in your book at all. Oh, you'll recognize a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Good. That's why I'm really <laughs> excited to read it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Incredible. Well, let's go back a little bit. Um, you know, again, you had such a fantastic career as a, as a songwriter and then as, you know, obviously as an artist and a producer. And um, again, so many iconic songs. Just again, just if, if you don't know Billy's music, go get on Spotify and just type his name in and you'll be stuck for hours. It's just one song after another, after another, after another. But, you know, again, every artist I have on here, because we're talking mm. about, you know, where we are now, there's always that that turn in the road where maybe the career's not over, but it's like, I I don't know what my next thing is. Like what, yeah. there's just kind of an end of the road. There's an end of that career arc. Can you kind of take us through where that was for you? Yeah, I think it was, of course, when the uh, the streaming technology took over and the, the royalties dried up, Mm-hmm. That really made a turn from Nashville. It was really tough to leave Nashville, but I, you know, was a candidate at uh, half a dozen churches to lead worship. And that led us to a wonderful eight and a half year season in North Denver. And raising kids out there was great. You know, everything's Mount Rushmore is right there. So that began the shift from being an artist and traveling and recording and having a record deal to the next phase, which was very rich. As we said, you know, being a part of a community that's on a mission um, is is fantastic. And you know, you're home every week. You can be at the Bible. Yeah. Study. You can be, yeah. you, you can you can be there for things. Um, and the, the traveling thing is, you know, it can be such a dotted line. You're in and out. You're in and out. Um, but and, you do have to wean yourself off of that because. Oh yeah, you know, it's not a smooth transition. It's not like no. oh, woohoo, I get to stay home. I get I'm home on Saturday nights now, or I'm right. You know, I'm not flying back home on Sunday, on Sunday morning. But there is that. That's all you've known, right? For decades. It's all you've done. It's it's. Uh, you know, I remember the first day, I that I I hadn't traveled in forever, and then I had to fly out and go do something. I'm kind of like I've lost all my skills in the airport. Mm. Like I don't. I don't, I don't feel mm-hmm. that same, you know, you know, looking down my nose at people who travel once a year is kind of going, get out of my way. I know what I'm doing. I yeah. was that guy. Now I felt so lost getting back out on the road, but there was that time where, you know, having to integrate back into my family's life yeah. on a regular basis, it wasn't easy. There yeah. were, there were a lot of bumps in the road. Uh, and so you had to feel that as well. Just, you know, yeah, just, both, you both of my life, both of my pastors at the churches, you know, I was at for 12 and a half years at, at two, two different churches and the church in Colorado was three campuses. And so I was in charge of three campus stuff for a while. And um, they gave me the leeway. You know, I know you, you're going to get calls to go to other stuff, seminars, concerts. And so I, I did that some I was in and out some. Um, but it mainly it mainly got me back to songwriting, especially worship stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you write an Easter song, write a Christmas song. Um, I could really worship was part of like there there are worship songs dotted throughout your career. Yeah, that, yeah. that I had kind of forgotten about. Yeah, yeah, and and that that became a, a great place. I didn't I wasn't thinking, oh, who can cut this song? It was we're going to sing this at Christmas. Yeah. And then we did a Christmas record, you know, out at uh, uh, the the church in Colorado. We did a compilation. We used the handbell choir and we used the choir. And oh, nice! And so, and I got to come that back and forth to Nashville to help produce that. So there was still uh, lots of ties to the Christian music, uh, at, you know, structure. But uh, that was a big part of the transition, and then. Uh, and I, I miss, I know you, I miss, there's something powerful about delivering songs live to people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's such a connection point. Um, and you can set up the song, uh, you can change a lyric, you can have a laugh. It, there's there's a very real synergistic thing that happens. And I think people are lifted and carried by that environment. And they well, go, you, and they you go way better. That. Yeah. And you can sing the same song to the same people the next week. That's right. That's yeah. right. It's like uh, one of the things I always, I always felt was that touring sing when I was singing on tour, I was feeding people with an eyedropper, you know, mm. I was just able to give them 90 minutes of, of our biggest songs. But when you're a worship pastor at a church, you're there, you're there week in and week out. 
with the right. same people, you have you, you. It's like you're feeding them more with a fire hose. You, you, you make much more impact, a, a greater yeah. impact on these people's lives than you did when you were just you know in a different city every night. Right, because you're 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 working with your worship team. You know yeah. these are people, and you there's a mentoring and a discipling that's going on, and you're being discipled by the people around you. So there's there's a real growth curve instead of you know. So it it went from thanks for having me to see you next week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and there's more accountability. That's and I think that's another thing that you, I, I think I I appreciated was there was more accountability on a deeper level now that I'm on a church staff and around the same people every week because there's very little accountability on the road. Yeah. Because you're in and out. You don't get people don't get to know you. They don't know yeah. your secrets. They don't know your habits, you know, except the people maybe you tour with or that mm -hmm. you do life with back in Nashville. The church scene is a whole different thing because now you're an open book and yeah. you can't, you know, it, it, it's a different way of living. And that's something I've, I've come to really appreciate uh, that I, now people know me. Yeah. You know, they, they know me as a neighbor. They know me as a, that's right. Know, as a church goer. They know me as a minister. They know me as they, they see what I've gone through. Yeah. I've been close to that over the years. It's real life. I'm yeah. reminded of, you know, Bob Bennett. We, we love Bob Bennett. He, yeah. he, he has a, a saying years ago, you know, he's big teddy bear. He said, you know, you know, he was talking to Bruce Carroll. And I said, you know, uh, once you get really good at what you do, they say you're done. <laughs> the industry, it, yeah, the industry says you're done. Yeah. And Bob is better, you know, writing. And we're all, I think, better at what we've uh, done than, than any time. And um, I think the stuff I'm writing now is as good or better than anything I've ever written. Mm. Very few people get to hear it. I am uh, speaking of uh, come what may. I'm just putting a compilation together of eleven kids songs uh, that I'm going to release called Hope Rope and uh, the songs I written for my kids over the years, and uh, that'll be out soon. Oh, that's fun! Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that, man. Again, just listening to Come Quat May just brought back so many memories, and my kids giggling in the car, and mm -hmm. you know, just saying, "Play it again, Dad. We love that song." And they would mm -hmm. ask for it on the way to school. Um, yes, yeah. that was one of their favorites. Yeah. Well, um, so if if there is a song that you feel like, or maybe two songs, I know you you had mentioned, you know, press on. Um, it was 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 kind of you coming out of that dark season in your life. It, are, are there a couple of songs for you that really kind of encapsulate who you are as a writer, as a you know, well, well like. Uh, maybe they're the same thing. Maybe they're the biggest songs of your career. What would those be? Well, the ones that come to mind are the song we mentioned before, La Vie, uh, Life is Hard, But God is Good. Because it's a, you know, it's a James Taylor picking thing. That's how I started. Yeah. And Gary Chapman produced it really well and, and put a pedal steel on it. And 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 the, the record company didn't want to release that. They said, you know, it's too personal. It has a verse about my grandmother, my sister who married an outlaw. And and it went to the top of the charts because people and everywhere I went, even I sang it in Romania, translated <laughs> before the wall fell. Oh, wow. And, and every because the pastor wanted me to sing it, he'd heard it because they knew life is hard. And God is good. And they came up and asked me, you know, how's your grandmother? It was very personal. And so uh, that one it, it really encapsulates who I am as an acoustic artist. Um, the other early on, and I didn't write this, but how could you say no? Yeah. Uh, it was used so many times in altar calls and stuff. Mm -hmm. over the, That was powerful. But I'd have to point to press on as a kind of flagship song. Uh, and a, maybe we eventually what's on my tombstone, press on. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, that honestly, that's the first song I think of when I hear your name. Yeah. And I just start singing it. You know, you mentioned even, you know, as you mentioned, um, um, what was the song you said you wrote for Debbie Boone? Um, uh, can you reach my friend? Yeah, can you reach my friend? You're the only mm -hmm. one. I mean, those, these songs just once it, it, they're so well written and so well done. You don't just sing the hook. It's like it, the whole song is a hook mm -hmm. and the whole, mm -hmm. you know, again, uh, you're just, in my opinion, just one of the greats to 
to grace the Christian music scene, oh, especially you, in that era. And and I agree with you. You know, it's 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 uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where you're like, well, gee, what does this mean, God? When you know you're finally at the top of your game, and they kind of they kind of shoo you out for the next generation mm-hmm. to come through next wave yeah yeah and you're yeah. just like i'm better than I ever have been yeah i feel like i'm a better communicator and singer than i ever have been but it's because we of of what we've seen what we've lived through yeah. what we experienced you know all the chaff is so much of that chaff is burned off now I'm right like, well, that doesn't matter this is this is we can serve a better meal to people now than we ever have well and, amen. i think so yeah and the challenge is now where do we what do we do with that is it just is it good enough that we just write this for a few people or that it's just for the Lord or, you know, how does this, how does this work moving forward? So I'm excited to see guys like you and Bob and, um, you know, I've had Bruce on the show, of, of, you know, of course, Gary was uh, a couple episodes ago, just mm-hmm. his story is just, and what a great storyteller he is and mm-hmm. rich history yeah. that he has all through Christian music, but to see everyone continue to do what they're gifted to do. And God always makes a way. Yes, it, just, he does. it just wasn't what it was 30 years ago and that's okay and that's what we as older yeah. artists have to be okay with that, that i'm going to continue to progress it's just going to look different than it did back then yeah it is i mean t- uh, there's a quick aside from for press on when it it went overseas to see you know south africa they don't have christian radio they just have radio right and, right and, and the, the radio person at Benson came to me and said, hey, look at this chart. You're on pop radio in South Africa. And it was like Sting, Madonna, Billy Sprague. You know? <laughs> Incredible. Because somehow the people of South Africa resonated with Press On because that's yeah. what they were having to do. Hmm. Um, and so it was so gratifying that it, it, kind of, it went outside of our subculture and connected because it's in a, it's in a, a universal sort of thing that people are up against it yeah. and then the encouragement to keep going. Yeah. And so yeah, it, it encourages me to keep going just to talk to you. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing my thing and put out a, a book for my kids and that I've been writing for over 12 years. It's called sacred versus Shinola letters to my children from the kitchen table. Hmm. And it's, you know, it's about what's sacred and what the world's trying to sell you basically. So I just keep, you know, trying to communicate the gospel in a fresh way through either prose or writing or leading worship, whatever, whatever God puts in front of me. So in this season, you know, I've turned again to writing, but writing different things because I have this, um, I have a lot of, I had a lot of solitude to redeem. <laughs> so I began to go down to the beach. I had some ideas for stories years ago, and the first one turned into Music City Mayhem which is a detective story set in Nashville with a, I don't want to give too much away because it's a detective story. Why, why a detective story? Like where, like that, well, why it, was that the first out of the box? Well, because the idea intrigued me years ago uh, about a very mysterious deaths happening and, and a, a, a detective, Max Malone, who is, he's an angry atheist. His mother died of cancer when he was 18 and he's got this case against God but he he does justice, you know, justice is his thing. Um, and so he's um, he's on a hunt for these these vigilante, you know, these pious vigilantes who are killing people. And um, and he at the same time, you know, God is on the hunt for him. Hmm. So and then the second one I, I had years ago is really, you know, that one covers eight days. But the second one, Untamable. I I trace a, a, a child prodigy classical pianist, a little girl, through 1930s Germany, through the war to Ireland, and uh, went over there a couple of years ago with my daughter to uh, do research. And it's how her faith in music got her her and her family through the war. So it's it's a panoramic sort of thing. Uh, those took a long time to write. You know, those, those take about 11 months to write. Wow. It's a, lo- a little more effort than a song. Yeah. Well, uh, but that fascinates me because I, I, you know, I know enough about songwriting that you don't go into a songwriting room usually, or when you sit down to write, you don't have a full song or idea. That's very rare that that comes right. to you. You have pieces and ideas, and it usually takes a, a lot of times it takes a co-writer to help you put the right pieces together or bring their right. idea. 
where do you start with a novel? I mean, like, is it, you know, are you watching a movie or do you read an article somewhere? Is, does this, does this character start to form in your mind? I mean, can you take us through that process a little bit? Well, the first one, the detective story came from a scripture I read in Proverbs, and I, I won't give it away, but um, you'll have to discover that. Uh, the, the, uh, the other one came as a result of hearing a story about a very evil uh, commandant at a POW camp in Germany, and um, a, a form of punishment that he used. Um, and so I wrote that into, I thought, man, that is just amazing sort of uh, evil. And so to set uh, a little girl who plays piano against him, you know, and how she navigates the evil, uh, that's where that came from. And I had that 20 years ago. And But I finally sat down, you know, these things, and we have a lot of things that are only living only living in our laptop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you have to get them out and and page after page and think, okay, back back story, where does the camera look next? Where does this go? Um, it's a long, long process, but but it's very healing. And in fact, I ran into a there's this a quote by a, a Spanish author that said, uh, a story is a letter an author writes to himself. Hmm discover what he wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. So I was dealing with a uh, post divorce, dealing with two Goliaths, anger and unforgiveness hmm. and the writing. If you read the books, you'll see that's woven in there of, of, of me dealing with that stuff through Max Malone, the character and what's going on in the other, the other story where Aneska faces the kind of evil that Corey Tim Boom forgave. Wow. You know, mm. so uh, they come from real life and from real inspiration. But then, you you know, the plotting it out and writing it out, choosing 130,000 words and putting them in the right order. Yeah. <laughs> is the is the hard uh, part. It just, uh, just seems like such a, I don't know, that, that seems like a lot of work to me. I've, cause well, I've, yeah, I've considered going, I should write, I need to, maybe not fiction, but I need, there's some nonfiction and some, uh, some books I need to get out. I'm just like, hey, yeah. what a daunting task that has to be to start. But I see, I mean, Cindy Morgan, uh, I've got mm -hmm. her book. I can't wait to, to yeah. crack that one open. And there's so yeah. many artists from that era that are now becoming authors. I think it's such a beautiful way to transition your gift into, you know, what else this could be. Yeah. With that, that spirit of, of writing that you have. Well, I encourage you to get those out. You, you know, you, you take it in bite size, you come up with chapter titles, things you want to say. And, uh -huh. and I'm telling you, the stories will come to, because the Holy Spirit becomes your co-writer. Yeah. You know, things will come to mind and go, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. You, you encourage me. I appreciate it. There you go. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to read them. Like I said, I, I was thrilled to open that box that you sent me and, and have those two books in there. And, mm -hmm. uh, Man, I just can't. Again, just I, I love that you're that you're continuing. Yeah, you know, I have to, don't, yeah, I have to. don't don't quit. I think that I think when God gifts us with this, He doesn't take it back. He just continues to, like you said earlier, the parable of the talents. The the, the right. good man the good manager comes back every now and then and checks on the progress. And if you're if you're continuing to make a return on the investment, That's right? That's and it right. doesn't have to it doesn't have to be double. Right. You know, he just wants to see that's you know, what he told the, you know, the one who buried it. He said, you could have at least took it to the bank and drawn a little bit of interest on it. That's right. He would have been happy with that. So it's not that we have to climb this same mountain that we did 30 years ago. That's not the point. The point is, God, I'm going to continue to do whatever I can to, that's right. to use this gift, to continue to be who you created me to be and to give you glory through it. Right. And then the results are up to him. We, we had no control over the results anyway, did we? No. Yeah. We, no. we, we talked about that earlier. You don't know if a song's going to hit. You don't know no. if you're going to get on the next tour. You, we've talked about this on a couple episodes that, you know, your record deal, the options aren't even yours. No. You know, you can <laughs> sign a three album deal, but it's one album with two options and they're the, they're the labels options, not yours. That's right. That's you don't right. You even know if you're going to get picked up again. Yeah. But the good backdrop, one our our family, the you know my kids, I've told them my, one of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs sixteen nine, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs your steps. That's right. 
and and the other collateral uh, value of this is I, I my, you know our kids are watching. Hmm. You know, does dad's faith work? Yeah. And I want my kids to see. You know, dad got knocked down a few times, but the Lord lifted him up and he kept going. 